The day before? Yeah, it was, it was <laughs> that's what we do sometimes. Hardware store. We literally went to a hardware store and said, oh, we got to figure this out, and we built it out there. So that is um, typical ham way of doing it. If you can't, if it doesn't work, then go reconfigure and make it work. So we, that's what we did. And yeah, and it does all, all the bands that we needed to do, but we actually sat at 60 meters and, and made that work. So it's 5.12, I think, megahertz, somewhere around there. 5.12, yeah. So, um, uh, so yeah, that was the, uh, that was the experiment. Um, as I said, the, uh, we could do, um, I have a few more minutes, so we could do direction finding. If you're interested in that, we could do it at 500 milliwatts. You had to know that somebody was there, first of all. You could, if you looked at the waterfall and you scanned around, you could see something was going on and we were able to pick it up, but at 100 milliwatts, it just totally dropped off on our other system, and it, we just couldn't pick it up. Um, the, the application and the information that we can use with that is that the current HF radio that we use in the Army is the PRC-150, and that one only goes down to 5 watts. So if we want to hide and that with that one with data, it's not going to work so well. Um, it does do data, um, not quite like FT8. It sounds a little, definitely it sounds a lot different, but... Uh, it does a tech chat method, and it also does digital voice. The, um, uh, the next version of the radio is a PRC-160. I think that one goes down to one watt, which will be more useful for us uh, if we want to try to hide in the noise. Um, and I guess I could talk real quickly on these radios, um, since this is an ionosphere group. Um, they, they, we've we've soldier-proofed these radios in the sense that we load them up with frequencies, and they basically instead of trying to figure out what's the best frequency to talk on, we give them like, let's say 10 frequencies that are built in there on different bands. And then the soldier just says, find best frequency. It sounds in the network and it, and, and it gives a, um, a signal report back and then says, okay, this is your best bet to talk to X station. And then when they make the call, it automatically switches that frequency. So the soldier has no clue, doesn't have to learn about, you know, doesn't have to get a ham license to be able to figure out how to use an HF radio. So that's the advantage of the of the military system the disadvantage is the price i don't even want to talk about that but <laughs> it's, it's a lot it's a lot more than Elecraft. it's about 20 times more than Elecraft. so uh yes but it does do encryption which obviously we don't do um <laughs> mars does do encryption that's the only like crossover between ham radio and military because we can do encryption in mars though so that's cool okay well with that i think uh yeah, you need to open up for questions. Yeah. Are you talking about oh the ALE? For for when we're doing the the uh yeah, it's got um so yeah, so what interestingly the, the Harris radio has a tuner in it and it tunes on each frequency and remembers the tune and it automatically goes back to it. Yeah, that's a great question. I've actually, you can hear it click and you know that it's doing that, but yeah. Oh, thanks. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's good to know. I, we, do, we do have some, I think they're Harris ones, but it's basically just a straight dipole. You can wind it out to what band you want it at, and then you just use that, and that's what we use when we're in Nepal, but it works pretty well. Okay. Yeah, 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 okay. That's actually like our DF system uses something like that, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, in yeah. cap, I use that when I go on, I look at the... The, the, it gives you like a percentage, and then it'll kind of tell you what band is going to be the right band. But, but to get the actual frequency, we didn't actually do that. I had to go with, it's, it's kind of awkward because, you know, well, in fact, Kyle just got his extra class license. I'm trying to license everybody so we can just jump on ham frequencies. But um, we sometimes use Mars frequencies because we don't have people that are always licensed. But I've, I've got like, I think I got like five people licensed last week. So 
we're, we're getting up to speed, but um, so it limits our frequencies. We were actually using the Mars. There was only like one or two frequencies per band. So once I choose a band, then I know what frequency I'm going to use. But I did, it's it's suboptimal probably. Yeah, uh, we use vocab to figure out what band, and then we just use the frequency that we're authorized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you, gentlemen. Dr. Bob Romanovsky of NASA. He, I first met him when he spoke for my general education course on history and censorship of communication. And if at the end of the term he could keep my class awake giving a talk, then really this should be exceedingly entertaining. My own antennas are usually of the mild and lazy type. His are the wild and crazy ones. Dr. Romanovsky. <clears throat> All right. Actually, I thought it was a little bit awkward to give a talk on antenna technology at a workshop focused on propagation and atmospheric research, but you know, antennas are electron to photon converters and photons propagate through free space, so there's a, there's a connection, and plus Christina said I had to do it. So, <laughs> so this is our division logo, um, and you might wonder what LC means. L is a designator for research and engineering. I have absolutely no idea why but C does stand for communications. So I'm gonna talk to you about some uh, perhaps unusual antennas that I've been involved with the development of for approximately the last eight to 10 years. Um, and we'll see what happens. So let's put things in perspective. You know, it's kind of remarkable when you think about it. Sputnik launched in 1957. That really wasn't all that long ago, right? A, a career and a half. And look where we've come. Look at some of the stuff we've heard about today. And this was a reflect, you know, this, there was nothing to Sputnik. So in, in roughly 70 some years, you know, look what we have. It's absolutely phenomenal. And I wonder what's going to happen next. And yes, the hams were very much involved in, uh, in picking up Sputnik. <clears throat> so this was a, uh, a certain type of phase dry antenna. I, how many? How many people here know what a phase dry antenna is? Awesome. All right, this is a little bit unusual because instead of directly radiating, uh, it, it's a reflector ray. So there's a, uh, a feed which illuminates a flat surface. So it kind of looks like a, a conventional prime focus parabola. But on that flat surface, there are phase shifters. And in this particular case, um, phase shifters based on thin film ferroelectrics. And you can tune the dielectric constant of the ferroelectric material of the DC voltage and hence control the propagation velocity of the signal propagating through it. And you can do that very accurately from zero to two pi. So you take advantage of constructive and destructive interference. And in this particular prototype, there are 615 radiators and you can form a collimated beam essentially anywhere in the hemisphere in front of the antenna. The trick is the phase shifters are between the amplifier and the radiators. So if it's a transmit antenna, they determine the efficiency, and if it's a receive antenna, they determine the sensitivity. So you need really, really low loss phase shifters, and there was nothing out there. At the frequencies that we're interested in, say X-band to K-band, most of the phase shifters, which are based on gallium arsenide or indium phosphide, have an insertion loss of 10 dB or more. So you just can't make a practical reflector array. So we developed these thin film ferroelectric phase shifters it's actually really simple. Um, there are two coupled microstrip lines, and they're patterned on top of a, a three or 400 nanometer thick barium strontium titanate layer. Those coupled lines serve as a bandpass filter and also electrodes to bias the film. And you can get about 45 degrees from each one of these coupled lines. And then we terminate the phase shifter with a, a switch that toggles between a short and an open. The short, of course, returns a phase shift of an additional 180 degrees. So we have 360 degree phase shifters and we were able to get an average insertion loss of between two and a half and three dB. So it's a, a new way to, to realize um, a scanning phase array antenna. K, well, X, X in our, it's like eight to 12 and uh, uh, KA is 26 and a half to 40. Okay, <clears throat> switching gears. Um, <clears throat> there's a, an anticipated proliferation, in fact, an insane proliferation of drones. I, I'm sure everybody's heard about 
unmanned aerial systems in the national airspace, it, it's going to be very, very interesting to see what happens. There's a tremendous commercial interest in using the existing cellular infrastructure to do beyond line of sight <coughs> uh, command and control. Okay, the cell towers were not. What? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I saw a reaction back there, and I wasn't sure how to interpret it. Um, <coughs> so they like to use the, uh, uh, the the cell towers to to do command and control of these drones. So um, Nokia, in fact, uh, uh, proposed that if you had directional antennas, you could eliminate what is no doubt going to be a very serious interference problem. Their plan was to use directional antennas and then select the antenna that had the best quality of signal. Okay, and I was approached to design an antenna. So this is and it was a little bit tricky because they wanted this thing to work from 700 megahertz to 1.4 gigahertz, which is a lot of bandwidth. <coughs> and you can see that the measured VSWR was better than about 1.8 to 1 over that band. Uh, this is a pattern at 1.7 and 2 gigahertz. And it's, uh, I, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with this type of antenna. Vivaldi was not the inventor. I believe this is actually named after a Renaissance period musical instrument, if I'm not mistaken. But it kind of looks like a trumpet, and it, it radiates where the width is approximately half a wavelength long. <coughs> but it's, uh, it's awesome because it is an extremely broadband antenna, and the, the goal was to have an antenna that had uh, a beam width of about 60 degrees over this bandwidth. And this was the solution. So hopefully they're going to execute a field test um, with the Ames Research Center sometime this summer. You know, the, the trick, the real trick to this was doing the impedance match that would give you this fairly good bandwidth. All right. <clears throat> um, anybody ever heard of a zone plate antenna? This is a, a zone plate antenna. It's a, a more or less flat replacement for a parabolic reflector. Basically, if, if you took a, a slice through a parabola and then sort of did the, this nested Santa Claus approach, uh, each one of these concentric rings is stepped by half a wavelength between an adjacent or with an adjacent ring. So essentially what happens is you, you form a collimated beam or a coherent beam at the focal point, just as with a conventional parabola. <coughs> Um, but, but it's flat. And there was a hypothesis that uh, since it's a, a band-limited device, the, the autocorrelation of the noise should actually look like a sync function, and there might be some noise cancellation. But the trick was you needed a feed that would illuminate it with a top hat pattern. So this is a, um, I, I synthesized this pattern using a, it's called the um, woodward lawson technique, the, you know, basically the the array factor is a summation of uh, a weighting function and then e to the minus j beta d cosine theta plus alpha. So you can do an iterative approach and, and, and synthesize a fairly arbitrary pattern. So the, the, the plan was to illuminate this um, entire diameter with a, a very flat amplitude so that you could try to um, realize this noise cancellation. So we, we haven't demonstrated that yet, but that's the plan. All right, this is a, uh, a kind of a simple antenna, but it was, um, it had a tune, it was very high Q, and it had a tune between GPS and Iridium. And if you use your imagination, you can probably think of some applications for such a thing. So this tuned from a little bit below 1.4 to a little bit above 1.6 gigahertz. It's more or less of a, a conventional patch antenna. The metallization is hogged out in the middle. That actually redistributed the current and, um, you really wanted the signal not to be as intense at zenith. You really wanted the signal to be a little bit stronger uh, towards the horizons. It also actually shrank the antenna a bit, so it is a, a low signature antenna. Um, you'll notice it's less than two inches, and it's working down around a gigahertz. Um, and you can see the, uh, the uh, return loss plots on the bottom right. So they, it, it's just a, a little wire wound inductor, and then a var actor is, uh, is what was used to do the tuning. This is what I'm working on right now. Um, NASA Glenn, which is about 20 miles south of here as the crow flies, in case anybody's wondering, is trying to land a probe on the uh, surface of Venus. Venus is extremely hostile. Besides an extremely caustic atmosphere and, and a pressure that's like 100 atmospheres, um, 
the, uh, the temperature is about 500 degrees C. So there's no, well, electronics will not survive. That's the bottom line. However, silicon carbide has shown promise. Silicon carbide has a really high thermal conductivity. It's a wide band gap. And we're trying to do the silicon carbide electronics. The question was posed, is there any way to use the communication system to determine the orientation of the lander so that they can measure wind velocity, that is wind direction, okay? And the answer is yes, and here's the way this works. It's hard to see, but there's a, um, a dipole and then a spiral. <coughs> so initially, uh, let me back up for just a second, and if I'm being pedantic, I apologize, but it's a property of a circularly polarized antenna that if you rotate it, you, the observer, will measure a far field phase shift exactly equal to the physical rotation, all right? So initially the antenna is linearly polarized. The orbiting spacecraft picks up, it's just a CW signal, it picks up a signal that measures phase, which is a completely meaningless number because the signal's propagating through God knows how many, you know, modulo two pi um, paths. And so you have a number between two pi that means absolutely nothing. Then you instantaneously switch to the spiral antenna, which is circularly polarized. Now the only additional information is due to the rotation. So you subtract off the first measurement from the second and you've just established orientation of the lander. So it's a way to do orientation with the comp system. And it works. The other trick, that's um, a mock-up of the probe. The entire thing is 25 centimeters on a cube. For reasons that I won't get into, the operating frequency is gonna be 100 megahertz. So it's really hard to put an efficient 100 megahertz antenna on a 25 centimeter anything. So the, this, this is the prototype of the final product will actually be fabricated on a, an extremely high contrast, an extremely high dielectric constant substrate. And that's what we're finishing up right now. This is, um, for apparent reasons I'm sure, nicknamed the beach ball. It's a, a 2.5 meter diameter antenna. Um, inside this ball, right down the, the equator, there's a metallized membrane. And you apply a differential pressure across the membrane and you form a parabola. The feed is mounted on the skin of the material. And what's nice about this is when you package it, it fits into a knapsack. You can be out in the field and deploy it and be on a geostationary satellite in about 30 minutes. So we helped develop this along with a gentleman named Paul Garreau who had a company called Gator. He recently sold it. He, had a, he won a contract from the Army, I think it was in 2014, for like $460 million. So my buddy Paul is sipping a Mai Tai somewhere right now. But um, it's, it's a really neat idea. Um, when Paul came to us in around 2007 or 2008, there was a 6 dB anomaly. The, the, the gain of this was 6 dB below where it should be. So we had him put a window in it. We mapped the surface of the membrane with a laser radar system and, and basically helped him optimize the differential pressure. That was one of the issues. And we also designed a, we customized a feed. By the time he left, and it, did it took several months to, to finish this project, but by the time he left, we had all but maybe a tenth of that 6 dB back and um, it, it's the world's first FCC certified inflatable antenna. And I'm almost done. I've still got a green light. <clears throat> uh, this is also a current project. We were trying to integrate a telescope and an antenna. These two things really don't want to go together. Why would we want to do such a thing? Um, deep space missions when higher data rates, they would really like to use optical communications. Nobody trusts optical communications because it's just extremely difficult to point. There have been some very successful recent near-Earth um, demonstrations. No mission planner wants to buy into that technology for deep space just yet. So the plan is use a more or less conventional RF system, in this case a 32 gigahertz and a 3 meter dish, and integrate an optical system without adding any extra burden to the spacecraft. It's really hard to do because these technologies are, are orthogonal to each other. The modulation formats are completely different. You know, RF is coherent. Uh, optical is, is PPM, pulse position modulation. Lasers are extremely inefficient. Traveling wave tubes are very efficient. <clears throat> um, just a lot of things that don't want to go together. One of the biggest issues or problems was the actual telescope will have, everybody's seen, everybody knows what a telescope is. You've got a telescope tube. 
this will too, because you need the subreflector to be supported. It has to be very stiff. All right. Um, you don't want it whipping around because you need to point this thing to within about two microradians. You've got a lot of spacecraft dynamics going on. Um, the vibration is a killer. <clears throat> so you need the, the connection to the telescope to be an extremely stiff structure. Bottom line is you want it to be made out of silicon carbide. Silicon carbide has an extremely high thermal conductivity, it has an extremely low um, CTE, coefficient of thermal expansion, and it has an extremely high modulus, an extremely high stiffness. The problem with silicon carbide is, and, and the way this works, the, the RF system is prime focus, so the RF feed is at the focus, right at the focal point. The optical subreflector is right in front of the RF feed, and then it's not shown here, but there's a tube, again, that supports the subreflector and a little spider mechanism that, that hooks up to the subreflector. That silicon carbide tube is opaque to the RF. So you've just blocked your um, signal from the feed, it never gets to your parabola. But silicon carbide is a semiconductor, right? And you can dope semiconductors and do things to control the conductivity. To make a long story short, <clears throat> when we started, a one millimeter thick slab of silicon carbide had an attenuation at 32 gigahertz of 40 dB. We've got that down now to 2 to 3 dB. And a couple of years ago, I had a really good uh, intern from Case. Her name was Christina Collins, and she actually helped me characterize some of the original samples. So Christina, as of last year, we, we met our goal, and we finally got transparent silicon carbide. <laughs> and it, it's, um, it's doped with an element on the periodic table. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> And uh, this is the wrap-up slide. This is where we're heading, cognitive antennas. I heard a lot of really exciting stuff today about software-defined radio. Cognitive radio is, is the logical follow-on to software-defined radio. So the combination of a cognitive antenna and a cognitive radio system is where we want to be. Basically, you sense what's going on in the environment. You know where the jammers are coming from. You know where the interference is. <laughs> um, you can optimize the, the modulation format, whatever, whatever you gotta do to, to have the best communications link you can. That will be enabled by not just a smart antenna, but an antenna that can learn. So we just started this project, um, but this is where, this is where things are, are headed. So I'll just leave you with, um, you know, if you ever need a specialized antenna to do your propagation research, don't be afraid to look me up. Thank you. So your research that you've shown so far has been in the higher uh, frequency ranges. Have you done any research with antennas with uh, low frequency or HF? No, I, I haven't. That, that doesn't mean that some of the stuff you know, couldn't be adapted, but most, in fact, the Vivaldi antenna for the, the, uh, the drone program, it's probably the lowest frequency I've worked with in the last 10 years. Most of it's microwave and millimeter wave. The, the Vivaldi's uh, very interesting. I added that to the antenna book uh, in the last edition. I've heard from some guys trying that maybe as a 70 centimeter through 20 centimeter um, antenna, it'd be a little bigger. Um, at HF, it's kind of interesting to contemplate an 80 meter Vivaldi, but uh, <clears throat> I'm sure if Tim was here, he, uh, K3LR was here, he'd be thinking about it. Um, how big does the ground plane have to be around the, the horn outline for it to function. I'm thinking of like a skeleton Vivaldi. So um, <clears throat> this, this diagram should explain that. So the, the actual radiating element serves as the ground plane for the microstrip. And then this is a, a radial stub. It's a, a quarter wave radial stub. It actually looks like a, provides a virtual short right at the juncture. And it's, even though it's a quarter wave radial stub, it has a bandwidth of, of over an octave. So um, this is the metallization on, let's, let's call it the, the reverse, it's copper. And then this yellow line is the metallization on the obverse, it's also copper. 
So that's it. That's it's just to the edge. I mean, the, it, it depends how you look at what's the ground plane or not. But that's the entire. There's no other metalization around it. That's it. And by the way, I, you know, everybody's interested in in antenna miniaturization. Um, the 100 megahertz antenna that I mentioned, it's going to be made on a dielectric constant of 100. And uh, it's going to represent a factor of 11.4 in, you know, in terms of physical reduction. So you can build things on very high dielectric constant substrates. Now, the bandwidth usually goes way down. I haven't even modeled that with a Vivaldi, but that might be really interesting to see what would happen. I think it would work just fine. So you'd have a physically small antenna, but it would be you know, electrically large. So it is a research program. I'm working with a spin-off from the University of Missouri. It's called Nanoelectromagnetics. And I literally just got the first batch of samples in within the last week or two. Um, the other trick with this antenna, again, it has to work at 500C, but uh, they, they use um, uh, barium titanate. And there's a, there are, are well-known mixing formulas. So it's in a, a polymer matrix. And the, the polymer that they're using, actually, it, um, it, it's volatile. so it, Basically, outgas is the first time you heat it up, but the binder's supposed to stay in place. So um, they're not super low loss. It's, it's probably, uh, the loss tangent is probably around 0.01 or so. But for this application, again, we don't need a super high bandwidth, and we can, we can live with that. Yeah, okay, that's a good question. And that the reason for each one is different. In the case of the Venus antenna, um, it's because of atmospheric attenuation, one reason. Two, the, the silicon carbide electronics that I just bragged about, <laughs> even though it's wide band gap and has a real high thermal conductivity, the mobility stinks. So you can't really make really high frequency devices out of it. So um, a decision was made to limit it to about 100 megahertz. And, and that's the justification for, for this. Um, the other, this. This one's obvious. It had to work at, at uh, you know, GPS and Iridium. Um, this one was arbitrary. It, it, was, it was an experimental antenna. This was KU band. And there's no reason this couldn't work at L band or X band or KA or whatever. Uh, the Vivaldi um, had to work with a whole bunch of different service providers. Hence the, the pain in the neck to make it work from 700 megahertz to 2 gigahertz. Uh, this was also an experimental program, so the frequency was arbitrary. You'll have to ask the um, Russians about this one. <laughs> and uh, the beach ball, this, they've got versions of this working from X to KA at this point. So it, it just depends on what satellite you want to talk to. And this one is 32 gigahertz because that's the frequency of NASA's Deep Space Network. So, thanks again, everybody. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh. Yep. So I was wondering... Um, is the zone plate antenna sort of the uh, radio analog for Fresnel lens? Yes, it is. It looks just like a Fresnel yeah, lens, it doesn't does, it? Yeah, it does, yeah. It's a reflective Fresnel lens, yes. 